Uh, welcome to the second presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Richard Griscom, and I'm the host for today's talk. The presentation itself will last approximately 20 to 30 minutes, and if you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application. Today's speaker is Professor Doris Payne of the University of Oregon. Professor Payne has conducted linguistic fieldwork in East Africa and South America, and she has been researching Ma and other Nilotic languages since the 1990s. Her research on Ma in particular encompasses a wide range of topics, including voice, possession, color terminology, directionality and associated motion, and the acoustic phonetics of advanced tongue root contrasts. She has worked with Ma speakers to create an online Ma dictionary and a online collection of texts. Today, Doris is presenting on Ma varieties from central Kenya to southern Tanzania. Uh, please join me in welcoming Doris. Thank you, Richard, and uh, thank you to all the participants um, of this webinar. It was, that's a great introduction, Richard. Um, as Richard's aware, yesterday when we were trying to get things set up, we discovered that the online dictionary is actually, some of the links are broken. Uh, it's hosted by the Uni University of Oregon, and I just haven't had time to go uh, work out what the details of all the broken links are, but hopefully we'll get that fixed soon. Anything else you want to say, Richard, no, to get no, started? Yes, okay, I, I'm going to talk mostly about some of the, just some of the general things about distribution of mob varieties and some points of the sound systems and how they, uh, what we know roughly about how they're different from each other, the different varieties. So the classic work on Maasai or Ma, uh, the, the term that is used for the language in southern Kenya is Enkutukol Maasai, um, the, the mouth of the Maasai, but people throughout the region where varieties of this, you might say, language cluster, dialects, sub-languages, languages are spoken, refer to their all of them refer to the, what they speak as Ma, as well as perhaps some other expressions like that. In 1955, Tucker, Archibald Tucker and John Olempaye published this uh, Maasai grammar with vocabulary. And in, interestingly, uh, there's a couple of maps at the beginning of that grammar and some other claims that have been made in the grammar that have I want to say largely been repeated and repeated and repeated that I think are not quite correct. Although I do want to say this is an absolutely marvelous grammar. And for a certain variety, it is 99.9% um, .9 correct as of 2010 or so. So what, what you see on your screen right now is the map that Tucker and Mpaye put uh, published about the distribution of the Ma varieties. And at the north here, which is roughly central Kenya, slightly above, um, above Mount Kenya, is the area of the Samburu uh, Ma speakers. Uh, not quite as, you can see they border on the edge of Turkana, although it's not as far, quite as far north as Lake Turkana. And then uh, the Chamus subgroup down here, the area where people say we are Mas, we are Maasai. And then as you get down into Tanzania, you can see Arusha area here and further down um, Sandawe and so on. Doesn't go so far south, this area that they delineated as Ma speaking or Maasai. This distribution of Ma or Maasai has been repeated multiple times and here, for example, is our maps from the ethnologue as of yesterday. Uh, I had to take two different pictures of this to show the distribution across the uh, Kenya-Tanzania border. So this would be the Samburu area, Samburu speaking area here. And you can see the, this little dot right here would be Chamus, Il Chamus. Um, and then what is referred to as Maasai by many people across the Kenya-Tanzania border. Uh, pretty much the same distribution as Tucker and Paye showed. 
but the actual distribution of MOS speakers, the, the best, I think, accounting of it is what has been published in the Atlasiya Luga za Tanzania by the University of Dar es Salaam. Um, this was published, let's see, what is the date of this? 2009, where teams of researchers from the University of Dar es Salaam went throughout Tanzania and all the districts and tried to come up with a better accounting of who speaks what where. And this uh, is a very rich atlas. Uh, the way that they did it was to try to figure out majority, what, what they call first, second, and third tier languages. So this particular map here on the left of your screen shows the areas where there's lots and lots and lots of Ma speakers, let's just say that. And you can see these little pink areas would be Ma speakers down here, the region of Mbeya. But when you go through the maps one by one and look for sec first, second, and third tier distribution, you see that actually there are areas all the way along here, if not some other areas, where you also find Ma speakers. So for here, for example, is the district of Dodoma, the map here, and this is showing third tier languages it's sometimes hard to see the different distinctions between the different colors, but this is the dark brown here is Maasai on this particular map. And you can see that there's, if you can distinguish the colors, a section of Maasai down over here and some down here and so on. So if we really filled out with pink dots all the way across this map, it would be much more filled in. Um, so the, if we go back to something like these Ethnologue maps here, we would really have to map Ma all the way down into here, at least. So the, the, I've also heard that there was a point in history where the Maasai or Ma-speaking people tried to push across the borders even further south into um, other countries, but were pushed back. So they are still trying to migrate in various ways, looking for land, cattle, cattle grazing, and so on. So with this dispersion, I want to talk a little bit about how distinct the Ma varieties are. And uh, we can address that both in terms of mutual intelligibility, but also sociolinguistic identification. So uh, the, in, Northern Tanzania, where we find people who say, well, we're from the Kisonko region or Kisongo region versus further south towards Iringa and Mbeya, Paracuyo. You, people can, in, this is anecdotal, but I would say that people can pretty well understand each other. But I was working with a, a woman from the Iringa area, but had a Kisonko university student who was attending university in Iringa helped me with some of the translation work. And there were parts of one, one or more texts that we collected for, uh, spoken by this woman from the Paracuyo region. And she and my university assistant said, there are parts of this that I just have no idea what this whole sentence means. So I take that to mean uh, mostly lexical kinds of differences, although there's also tone differences, as we'll see soon. But the degree of intelligibility, they would have conversations back and forth among themselves without trouble. But just another anecdote, too, I was talking with um, a couple who had been doing mission work in Kenya for quite a period of time and then moved across the border to Tanzania and were in the Arusha area. Their early work was with Loitokitokma, which is on the Kenya side. And they said as they went up various hills and so on on the Arusha Tanzania side, they said this is just anecdotally seems like a foreign language to us. We don't understand quite what's going on. So the issues of degree of mutual intelligibility are, um, it's not like 100% throughout air, the whole region. When it comes to sociolinguistic issues and identity, 
on the Kenyan side at least, the Samburu, um, for many purposes, really do think of themselves as distinct group, wanting their own literature, um, their own reading materials, their own dictionary kinds of materials, as opposed to the Maasai, who are further south in Kenya. So at least, even if there's a reasonable degree of mutual intelligibility, they still have distinct identities. Um, so, when, for example, if we talk about Samburu versus Maasai lexicon, there's actually quite a lot of differences, which we now know from uh, dictionary work that has been done. In about the 1970s, Ronnie Sim, who worked with SIL, uh, did a number of lexical comparisons across the region, and these figures, these particular figures are come from the ethnologue, but I am pretty sure it's reflecting Ronnie Sim's work. So he said that the Samburu and Chamus varieties have 94 to 88% uh, shared lexicon, whereas Samburu with Maasai further south in Kenya, 89 to 77%, and that the figures or say literature that would work across all varieties would break down in there. 77% um, is not, it would be difficult to use the same literature and um, for example, and really makes a lot of school materials work well. Um, so those are just some figures from the ethnologue. Uh, interestingly in Tucker and Paye's, um, in Tucker and Paye's grammar, the begin, the introduction to their grammar, Tucker describes the conditions um, and areas that he collected data from in working out that grammar. And he said that the data that he had collected, including from Tanzania varieties and Samburu varieties, as well as the speech of John Mpaye, John Ole Mpaye, he said, I'm sure that this grammar covers all varieties. I've checked it out and so on. But that really is not, I think, an accurate statement of the way the varieties are, are on the ground. The, the Tucker and Mpaye grammar very adequately, um, with very high degree of accuracy, covers the il, well, the, er, the type of Ma that's spoken in the region of Narok, Kenya, and generally southern Kenya and across the border into Tanzania, but maybe not Arusha. So certainly when you get up to Samburu region or Parakuyo regions, I would not be able to, I, I cannot support the statement that Tucker and Paya made at the beginning of their grammar. So what I have to talk about um, I'm abstracting some things from this paper that was published at the University of Dar es Salaam 2012, Phonological Variation in Ma Varieties, with some implications for grammar and a few other pieces of information that I've actually gotten from talking to various people, both in terms of my field work with various people, but also other researchers. And so I apologize for not properly citing all of the speakers who contributed this data, as well as um, some names of researchers who've been involved across the years with these varieties. So let's first of all take just a real brief look at lexical variation. The word for elephant um, is an interesting one. As you might know, um, the Ma varieties, Nilotic languages in general, uh, use tone very, very heavily for many things. And certainly in Eastern Nilotic, Southern Nilotic, case marking, number um, on nouns is heavily involved with, tone is an important feature in marking those kinds of distinctions. So in the region of Nairobi, Narok, Southern Kenya, and so on, you see these different forms like oltome, oltome for the singular forms object and subject, oltomia, object plural, subject plural, iltomia, um, and so on. If you go to northern Kenya, the Samburu region, you see this kind of variation, iltome, iltome, iltomia. Um, the, I have a gap in my data here for the subject plural tone form. The made, some of the major differences you see uh, along here in 
southern Kenya and northern Kenya Ma or Samburuma is the dropping of this initial vowel um, off of words. This is very, very characteristic. This is very regular, and it's a very salient sociolinguistic marker. Now, is that going to impede intelligibility? Not unless somebody wants it to impede intelligibility, um, but it's very, very salient to them um, as a stereotypical kind of mark, mark of the difference. Uh, in northern Tanzania, uh, working with a Kisongo speaker, I was absolutely surprised to find that the tone patterns on the um, the case related to case marking switched. So in the Kisongo, for this Kisongo speaker that I was working with, the form Tome, which is identical to the subject form in the Nairobi region, actually was the form that he insisted and used in all kinds of sentences as the object form. Well, is that going to lead to loss of intelligibility? I think it certainly could depending on the discourse context in the right situation could set up different kinds of confusion. Ultome is a little bit different from untome for the subject versus the object form. Then for the object plural, we found a suppletive kind of relationship with ulkanchaoni being the object plural form. So the substitution of lexical items. Going down to Southern Tanzania, Paracuyo region, we found yet more tone variations. And again, I have some gaps in the data here, but the object singular form would vary even for the same speaker between oltome and olto, oltome. And for the subject, for the object plural form, iltomiak or iltomiak. And the degree of tonal variation in southern Kenya, Parukuyo definitely needs a lot more research, but it was very, very hard to get a, always a consistent form, certainly in um, kind of elicitation contexts. And I'll come back to this issue of tone in southern Tanzania and Parukuyo later. So certainly you find tone variation and you find initial vowel dropping in northern Kenya, ta Tanzania. So getting to this initial vowel dropping, that's part of a little morpheme or piece of the word uh, that we can call a, a proclitic, a little morpheme that marks a combination of gender and number. And the Samburu nouns, as we've said, lack that initial vowel here. So if you look at the Southern Kenya, what uh, Tucker and Clay just called Maasai generally, the masculine singular proclitic is ol, feminine singular en, masculine plural il, feminine plural in. And so that vowel is very important in distinguishing number and the consonant part is what really distinguishes gender. If, when you go to the Samburu region and you drop that initial vowel, you can see that what you're also dropping is the number distinction and just keeping the gender. Um, so this feature um, as I've said before, is extremely sociolinguistically salient, and it's what we would call a shibboleth. People say, oh, I know exactly where that person is from. They're not from my group, or they are from my group, depending on that variation. Uh, when you take, go to Parakuyo, so this is down in southern Tanzania, sort of the Uringa Mbeya region, just with these um, same morphemes. So I, I apologize for the quality of these pictures here that I lifted from this 2012 article. But again, here what you see is the uh, forms that you would find in Southern Kenya, right here, the N and the in, for example, for feminine singular and feminine plural. When you go down to Parakuyo, you find for the masculine varieties, um, on, whereas in southern Kenya you would find ol, you also find or as you get to less prestige, perhaps less some less prestigious varieties. But down in Parakuyo region you find on. Um, and so one of the things that you can see here is that the masculine has this nasal element as well as the feminine having a nasal. 
So the feminine and the masculine forms sharing that nasal, um, it potentially, you know, somewhat marked in how, what it sounds like, but also the salience of that nasal or feminine in some regions showing up in the masculine variety further south. Um, so um, here's some, just some other attestation in some, some particular words, the word for tree, the word for sound, and so on, showing that on form for masculine. Okay, let's go on and talk a little bit about bell harmony. All varieties of ma have ATR harmony. One of the things that we see in Samburu, though, is more extensive rounding and height harmony than in some of the southern varieties. Um, and this also affects person perspectives on verbs. So in Ilwa Sinkishu, Kenya, which is south, what, a little bit southwestern, um, pretty characteristic also of the Nairobi region, you find forms like medol, where the third person singular form is e, this particular word means they could not see it. Um, if we also found, uh, say, Southern Kenya, Ilke Konyoki variety, uh, here you see a third person form, Mekurt, in here also with the E form for third person singular. In the Samburu region, what we find instead, instead would be Modol with this O for third person form in this particular context, because there's a kind of a rounding harmony here, even though both forms, the O and the O, are minus ATR in both varieties. Um, if you had the verb root for dung, you would find modung, whereas in southern Kenya, it would be medung with plus ATR varieties. So that also, you know, small change, and might say they're regular substitutions, but you start adding up the lexical differences, the consonant and vowel variations, and so on. Another salient um, marker, although maybe not quite, well, it, to me as a linguist, salient difference is some of the sound changes across the region. One of the interesting ones is, uh, we might say the form ch, uh, spelled ch right here, pronounced as this applicant ch. You find words in Samburu have much more ch in them, whereas in Maasai, cognates or words that descend from the same parent word, where Samburu has ch, Maasai will have either sh or ch depending on the environment. So after a consonant, a word will have ch in it, and elsewhere it will have the sound sh in it, which um, uses this technical symbol. In Samburu and Maasai both, but certainly Maasai, you only find the sound h in some exclamatory words, a very small handful of words, um, maybe six to ten words in our rather extensive dictionary material. But when you go to cognates of Samburu and Maasai down in Arusha and Parakuyo area, where Samburu and Maasai would have ch or sh, we find h or h instead. In not it cognate with the words that the exclamatory words that have h in Maasai, but cognate with the ch and sh form. So you find this kind of differentiation in the sound systems. But actually, as you get into Arusha and Parakuyo, it varies somewhat by word. So this is a gradual difference in process. So looking at some of the Southern Kenya Ma particular examples, the word for herding would be pronounced sho or above, sky, heaven, those kinds of concepts, top, shumata, with that sh sound at the beginning, and you would find h, ho, a word like, well, nevertheless, or hoe, uh, an expression of agreement, uh, especially in some songs you find hoe. When you uh, look at a word like the root for rain or rainfall, you find enchan in, um, all areas that I've, where we've checked this word, Samburu, Southern Kenyan, Ma, Arusha, Kisongo, Parakuyo, but this has this little gender prefix, N, at the beginning. So in Samburu, it actually would be like Nchan, but it has this Ch form at the beginning of it. Um, when you get further south, however, 
you find that's the sound, that ch sound that is turning into h here. Um, so uh, I won't necessarily elaborate that particular issue further. Uh, one of the salient things about a rushama is uh, changes in the sound um, cognates that would have the sound p in them. So in Kisonko ma, which is quite similar to Southern Kenya ma in most ways, we find the form for it is roaring as a purito, or excuse me, a purito without a trill there. In Arusha ma, we find aivur, aivur with a bilabial fricative there for to roar or it is roaring. So a change from p as a stop to <laughs> as a bilabial fricative in that particular word. There is another root pur, meaning to rob, so it's a different lexical item. And in arushama, this one is pronounced with a voiceless bilabial fricative, ifurito, or excuse me, ifurito. Um, I'm not a native speaker of this. <laughs> language, unfortunately, we need some recordings from native speakers to really show the difference. So in um, Levergood's dissertation on the sound system of Arushama, she described this sound here as quite a regular correspondence to the P in other varieties of Ma, but didn't mention this bilabial voice fricative, which apparently also occurs. I don't know enough, um, have enough information on where you might get this voiced one versus where you might get this voiceless one, but at least with the speaker that I worked with, um, this was quite consistent across those two uh, different lexemes. Um, I'm sorry, this is a little bit uh, less organized than I would like. This slide here just shows the, I'm sorry, this goes back to the ch, sh, h form, uh, just showing that intervocalically the what we find is the ch sound is sh in southern Kenya ma, Kisonko, San Samburu, but further south, Parakuyo, variably in Maasai, at least Kisonko by younger generations, e ha, the same cognate word. And here's the word for to go, chomo in Samburu, shomo in southern Kenya ma, across the border into Kisonko and Samarushu, Arusha, but homo in Parakuyo and also in somewhat in by speak Arusha and Kisongo Ma, Ma speakers. Um, so, uh, another difference that we find that I think can possibly lead to some confusion or at least take some time to get used to is the issue of contractions, which is common in all languages. Um, in Kenya, and Kisongo Ma, we find this little clause introducer, we could call it an adverbial conjunction, pe, and sometimes even in the form peye, even a bit longer. Uh, one meaning of this is the idea of result or purpose or so. So here I've translated it as so that I will come. And this form Pe alotu, so that I will come, is a form that you would find in both Kenya and the Kisonko variety in northern Tanzania. But then we find a Kisonko speaker would also say pa alotu, and what you see going on here is a, a kind of a coalescence or a vowel harmony between a and a, where a is just used throughout that whole thing but still a long vowel in there, pa, lo, tu. So since a Kiso the Kisongo speakers that I worked with could do it either way, you say, well, we've just got some contraction going on there, a more careful speech form versus a more rapid or casual speech form. Um, another example with another root, uh, if we had the root for cut, we get idun. Uh, so in Kenya and Kisongo, pe idun. And again, a Kisongo speaker could also more casually or in more rapid speech say pidum, pidum, where again you see the complete coalescence of those vowels, but still keeping the long vowel. So you start to see, okay, at what point do we say that we've got just a p, p prefix here? Further south in Tanzania, 
you see comparing these two forms between the Kisonko and the um, Paracuyo form Palo too, where you get vowel shortening and Pidung instead of Pidung. Um, so now it looks like you just pretty much have just a prefix on there um, and are losing the vowel length and the, the independent form as well, just a prefix kind of difference. Okay, um, just, uh, I'm gonna ask Richard a question. How many more minutes should oh, we wait? Thank you. Okay, um, all right. So just the uh, accusative versus nominative tone patterns and some of the lexical things that, I know this is an unreadable chart here. It comes out of this 2012 article in case you're interested. But the thing to look at here is where the red circles are. So um, I, in trying to get a summary sense of where there might be isoglosses or dialect boundaries, I divided the um, Kisongo and Arusha and Tanzania varieties here, called them number two, and the Kenya, Southern Kenya varieties, I called them number one. So don't worry about these little letters here. They're just marking the, representing different areas of the different countries. But where you see the red circles is where you see different, you see two forms, two different forms uh, showing up for case number forms. And where you really see lots of these red circles is in the plural nominative. Well, that's kind of interesting because that's actually the, probably I'm guessing, I'm more, it's a very educated guess, let me say that, that the plural nominative form is the least frequent one that people would encounter. So the, sing, the singular accusative is the uh, citation form in general and um, the, the form that has the widest distribution in the grammar. Uh, the plural accusative would be the most common form for the plural, again, having the widest distribution in the grammar if you wanted to designate plural. Singular nominative, pretty common. Plural nominative, least common. And that is where you see the most tone variation or other slight variations showing up in at least these uh, five or six words that we did pretty careful comparison of across there. So where you see less frequent form is probably where you get the most diversity, uh, probably due to various kinds of um, leveling or analogical pressures, or somebody just doesn't, as they're acquiring the language as a child, whatever, just don't hear the form repeated that often, and so more innovation happening in that domain of the grammar. Now, when you get into Parakuyoma, as I said earlier, I think this is an area where we need much more research, especially of what's going on with the tone. Um, I couldn't often with um, even the same speaker on the same occasion get a lot of tone variation in how particular words were pronounced. But one characteristic of them um, and across speakers was that often nouns would be pronounced with just a high kind of level pitch or a high falling kind of pitch like or um, Whereas in Southern Kenya, Ma, um, in this set of words, we had like for the word rib, olarasi. Um, in Paracuyoma, olarasi, warthog, olbitir, and Paracuyoma, olbitir. So a change on the tone on the initial uh, gender number proclitic. The word for toothpick or small wedge, ng pet. In Paracuyoma, ng pet, the word for leg, which I would think would be a very common body part term, enkeju, as opposed to enkeju or enkeju, uh, the word for tail, orkidongoi, orkidongoi, the word for cheek, eseder, um, in Paracuyoma, eseder. And so there seems to be a general leveling of how the tone is coming out in Paracuyoma in, in citation forms or isolation forms. What's really uh, unchecked, although I have some initial suspicions, is that there is more tone variation showing up when words are actually put into sentences. So some kind of perhaps some retention of the case differences um, in Paracuyoma, but at least in citation forms, there's just this general 
tone high or a high falling tone pattern that seems to be used, but with variation possible. Um, so it looks to me like there's possible tone loss in Pratakuyama or tone leveling. Um, so finally, I want to address some of the issues of how Ma might or might not fit in with the Rift Valley network languages and um, uh, sort of shared features across there. So this table was shared with me by Richard Griscom um, from work uh, coming out of Rotland's work and um, um, Kiesling's work, comparing a number of languages in, I would say, the northern Tanzania Rift Valley area. And Maasai is one of the languages that is listed in this chart. So this chart is not from my work, but um, the pluses and minuses on here uh, from the work of Rotland and Kiesling. And I really agree with the pluses and minuses all the way down that column for Maasai with very, two very, very slight um, notes I'll make. And those are the ones related to whether that I've put in, circled in red here. So uh, when they talk about a preverbal clitic complex, um, it's not clear to me entirely from this particular table whether that was referring to nouns or verbs, but I, I assumed it was related to verbs. Well, you do find clitic slash little prefix forms related to clause combining on the beginning of verbs in ma, as we saw with that form pe or pe or collapsing as p. Um, so there is some preverbal clitic stuff, and certainly on nouns, there's also prenominal clitic showing up there. In terms of verbal plurality, um, there are some lexical items that are distinguished by distinguished for number. Uh, so you find the word for go has lo as or lot as the root for go and po go singular and po as the root for go plural. It's not very extensive that you would distinguish verbal polarity in that way, um, but there, there's a little bit more too. So to be black singular has a short vowel in it, to be black plural has a long vowel in it. So you do see some lexical items that have that. But otherwise, I think that this listing of pluses and minuses is quite correct for what I have certainly found. Um, and given that, Ma Maasai doesn't look very much like, um, or it has quite a number of differences from the languages to the left on this chart, like Sangawe, Hadza, and various Bantu languages. So with that, um, I will stop rambling on and um, see what if there are any questions. All right, thank you, Doris. Uh, we have one question from Andrew Harvey. Um, Andrew asks, uh, oh, he says, I, I'm interested in what you think could be driving this diversity. Is this entirely a question of language internal change, or do you see any contact stories in the data? That's a really interesting question that I, um, off the top of my head, I would say language internal change seems most likely to me for these kinds of sound differences related to vowel harmony, the gradual differentiation of ch, sh, h across the region. Uh, the part that I'm least sure about that might be due to various kinds of contact phenomena might be the tone changes or the loss of tone if that's what's going on in Paracuyo Ma. So as the Ma speakers have pushed further and further south, more, in, more and more little pockets of speakers here and there across Tanzania region, uh, as people are coming more and more into contact with Swahili, um, does that lead to some kind of loss of the tonal case marking system? Of course, other Bantu languages besides Swahili have lots and lots of tone. That's not the issue, but they don't use it for case marking. But I really don't know uh, whether there would be some contact influence there. Um, but most of the kinds of differences I've talked about here, I think would be due 
to just language internal change. Uh, thanks. So I, I have a follow-up question of my own. Uh, so one aspect of this uh, Tanzania Rift Valley area that came out of the last talk that we had in the webinar series was that this grouping of languages uh, doesn't necessarily represent uh, an area of uh, contiguous communities as uh, such today, but rather um, a, a, historical, um, a historical linguistic area where all the communities were in contact, even if they aren't in direct contact today. So I'm just wondering if you could provide some brief background on the history of Ma in this region. So how recently did Ma speakers enter into Tanzania um, and what sort of contact did they have with other language communities there? Excellent question. So my knowledge of this would go back, not direct knowledge, but from the literature, would go back to the 1800s. There is work by Kropf, and some other early mission work, uh, missionaries, I think mostly from Germany, um, who talked about the Kwapi or Kwavi, Kwafi, uh, different kinds of groups. And the word for land uh, in Ma is Kop. And whether that's where this term comes from or not, uh, uh, it's a possibility that it comes from that term. But when you look at the data in some of these works, it's clearly some variety of Ma. Uh, so uh, in the Tanzania region, Ma was there certainly in the 1800s. Um, that's not that long ago. Um, some of the estimates of, you know, they say uh, that the Ma incursion or the Eastern Nilotic incursion <clears throat> Uh, into regions where there were previously southern Ma, like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, where there was uh, the Datoga and Kalenjin varieties of southern Ma. Or southern Nilotic. Thank you, a southern Nilotic. Um, some of the speculation, uh, I want to call it speculation, but uh, by um, Rotland, I think, um, some of the works in Diemendahl's work, um, Christopher Errett's work, other ideas on migration patterns suggest that Cushitic speakers were in that area early on, that su a Southern Ma was in some of those areas early on, and that Eastern Nilotic pushed through those areas. So you see various kinds of suggestions about bar lexical items that are borrowing, possibly borrowings in Eastern Nilotic from Southern Nilotic or from Southern Nilotic from Cushitic. Um, so that's not a very satisfactory answer on that, but as these things go in historical terms, a couple to, you know, let's say five, 500 years or so at least, um, fairly recent incursions into the area. Sorry, my voice is going out here. No, thank you, that's great. Uh, so we have uh, another follow-up question from Andrew Harvey. Um, so it says, given your extensive experience in field methods and field work, I'd very much like to know what kind of projects you think would help us to develop our understanding of the Ma varieties in contact with the Rift Valley language area. <clears throat> well, basic primary documentation and, and description, I think, is called for. So thinking about the claim that my uh, contacts with, um, I think it's the Christian Missionary Fellowship um, group, the, the comment that they made, this was 10 years ago or so that I was in this conversation with them, and where they said, the forms that we're hearing up some of these hills, Arusha varieties, just seem so different. Nobody's documented what the differences are how extensive they are, whether it's, you know, one hill, whether it's a certain age group, whether it's how widespread that is. The work that I've seen uh, by Levergood, um, Barbara Levergood, her 1970-ish, 1978 dissertation, um, also some work done by Michael, um, I'm sorry, his name starts with a K. Michael Karani. Michael Karani, thank you. Um, <clears throat> for his work in 
um, Arushama, don't strike me as all that different. Uh, you know, Barbara Levergood documents some differences in the phonology, but there's not a lot of work on the lexicon or on verbal morphology or the degree of vowel harmony, uh, these kinds of things that add up to uh, mutual intelligibility. So I think that before anybody <clears throat> gets into really talking about contact, you know, influences back and forth, we just simply need to do more hard slogging field work, the painstaking kind of work. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I maybe could just throw in there that uh, the, these are interesting questions, of course, everybody's kind of interested in the big scale sorts of things, but I've seen this so often in South America too, where people just jump to the big picture before that hard work of just slogging through. I, I shouldn't say slogging because I like this kind of work, but it does take time and it does take uh, sweat to collect each little word and what's the tone pattern on that and so on. All right. Uh, thank you, Doris. I think that concludes our presentation for today. And just briefly, I'd like to announce the following two presentations in our webinar series. So on Wednesday, May 1st, uh, I will be giving a presentation on the linguistic diversity among the, the Toga. Uh, then on May 15th, that's also Wednesday, Alice Mitchell of the University of Bristol will be giving a talk on language contact and experiences of Swahili among rural Toga children. All right, thank you everyone for participating and we'll see you at our next webinar.